Mr. Justice B. N. Shri Krishna, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, who has consented to deliver today's lecture. We extend a very warm and heartily welcome to him, as well as to our Honorable Mr. Justice Arvind Kumar, Chief Justice, Gujarat High Court, for joining us in today's sessions. Before we get started with today's session, as per our tradition, let us all seek blessings of the Almighty with a prayer by Shri Amar Bhatt. He is going to present Sadaswati Vandana followed by a few verses from Agatala Stotra written by Rishi Mark Kendika.
Now I request Senior Advocate Shri Shail Suresh Shailar to deliver the welcome address. Learned friends, good evening to all of you. It's a matter of pride and privilege for me to join Justice K. M. Mehta and Major General Nilendra Kumar in extending a very warm welcome to you all. We are particularly gratified and happy that Honorable Justice B. N. Sri Krishna has found time and agreed to speak to us today. The subject as chosen by him is Indian Constitution, values and cultural values. Are they dichotomous? The subject as selected by him is one which was very close to the heart of Nani Palkhiya. We are indeed grateful to you for gracing this occasion. We are also very happy to have in our midst Honorable the Chief Justice, Justice Arvind Kumar. Honorable Chief Justice Arvind Kumar was enrolled as an advocate in 1987 and soon had large practice in the field of civil, criminal, taxation and fiscal legislation. He also assisted the Central Bureau of Investigation by skill. He was appointed as a judge of the High Court of Karnataka on 26th of June 2009. My Lord, the Chief Justice conducted orientation courses for the junior lawyers. He was associated with National Legal Services Authority and was one of the board member of Arbitration and Conciliation Center, Bengaluru. Has been associated with number of voluntary organizations. My, my Lord was appointed and elevated as our Chief Justice of our High Court on October 13, 21, and is rendering his guidance to the destiny of our High Court. Honorable Justice Sri Krishna was appointed as a judge of the Bombay High Court on 13th July 19 and was appointed as a Chief Justice of Kerala High Court in September 2001 and was elevated as Supreme Court Judge on 3rd October 2002. During his tenure as a Judge of the High Court of Bombay, Justice Sri Krishna was appointed as one-man commission to inquire into the root riots that took place in Bombay during December 92. My Lord also headed a committee for separate Telangana state and submitted his report to the government. My Lord was also associated chairman of the Sixth Central Pay Commission. My Lord was also appointed to inquire into the riots in Madras High Court in February 2009. My Lord submitted his report on new data privacy laws for India. He is a scholar and we await his discourse on the subject. The Nani Palkiwala birth centenary celebrations were held in the year 2019. The birth centenary started with the quiz on constitutional law held on 3rd February 2019 and also culminated with a quiz on constitutional law held on 2nd February 20. 14 different events that took place were organized on different dates. The events were designed in the form of quizzes of constitutional law, Palkiwala lectures on specific themes, panel discussions, and Palkiwala debate. We were keen to organize event at Ahmedabad. We had scheduled Palkiwala lecture by, by my Lord Justice Sri Krishna on 14th March 20. However, the event had to be canceled at the last minute due to the pandemic. We again requested him to provide us discussion on the same team. My Lord agreed and we have assembled here today. Nani Palkiwala's greatest work is in his book on the law of income tax. That is a masterpiece. It is read, read and seven decades have passed. Recently 70 years celebrations were held for the said book. Palkiwala came from middle class family and made his mark up by sheer brilliance and hard work. One thing about him was his humility. I do not want to take more time, more of your time. We are very keen to listen to the eminence and distinguished guests that we have invited this evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your honest welcome address. I request Honorable Mr. Justice B. N. Shri Krishna, former Judge Supreme Court of India, to enlighten us on today's topic.
I request Honorable Mr. Justice B. N. Shri Krishna, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, to enlighten us, us to on today's topic. <clears throat> My Lord, the Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court, Justice Arvind Kumar. my brother judges from the supreme court from the high court and other courts in india all past present and future judges namo namah <clears throat> before i start talking i have to make one apology the lecture was cancelled sometime in march 2020 because of the pandemic and i was almost afraid that i might have to cancel it for the same reason because i was been i have been down from almost one week it is only because of sheer will power that i'm sitting before you and trying to talk for an hour <clears throat> god will give me enough strength as they say shreyam si bahu vignani when you try to do a good job there are always hundreds of difficulties and it is the goodness of god that we are able to overcome them <clears throat> uh as in the fitness of things and the cultural tradition let me also begin with a prayer namassadase namassadasaspataje namassakinam puroganan chakshushe namo dibe nama prithivyai so namaste to everyone that is present here in front of me back of me all over the world namo namaha <coughs> two sentiments about the great human being in whose name this lecture is being organized before i actually talk on the subject my acquaintance with shri nani palkiwala came about because he was a very good friend of my father who was incidentally also a very senior advocate in the bombay high court and the supreme court <coughs> this is going to be a problem <coughs> two occasions one is <clears throat> there was a celebration we uh, we were all part of the shankar march in bombay we used to have a shankar jayanti celebration during vaishak shukla panchami and a few days before or after on one of the occasions my father invited mr pakhiwala to come and deliver a lecture there i was very young i was not even a lawyer at that time i was hardly 18 19 something like that <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen he gave a brilliant lecture on adi shankara acharya's efforts at integration of society not a scrap of note not a scrap of paper in front of him but he concisely and precisely encapsulated all that philosophy that the great uh, savant ever propagated that was my first brush with Sri Palki Bala and I got introduced to him there as a youngster. Next is after I finished the riots commission, there was some occasion where I happened to bump into him, and as soon as I said I'm so and so, I was a judge by that time. <clears throat> His reaction was immediate. He came forward, embraced me, and started crying. I was surprised. Why is this man crying like this? and he only said you have done a great job you have done a great job you have done a great job that's all he didn't say anything and said god bless you that was palkiwala and this is the reason why i said this is necessary for us to talk about this today we talk about our cultural traditions we talk about the constitutional traditions and keep on saying that one is bad the other is good or both are contradictory are they really contradictory is there a dichotomy between them is something that we must explore with a clear conscience so that we can lead our lives as our lives are meant to be 
with this kind of a prefacing, let me jump into the subject. <coughs> Please pardon me. <coughs> Sorry. Comparative examination of the core values in Hindu culture and tradition with our constitutional values leads one to the conclusion that they are basically similar. The contemporary realities at the ground level, however, show wide divergence and dichotomy in several respects. There is imperative need to analyze some of such core constitutional values and to attempt a reconvergence of the precepts with the practices. Now, what are our great constitutional values? The first one, <clears throat> the core value in the Indian constitution has been articulated in the preamble to the constitution, which has been described as a signature of the constitution. The preamble to the constitution as passed by the constitution assembly reads as under, I know we are all familiar, but like the mantra that we normally keep repeating, we should all repeat it this today also. We the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status, opportunity, and to promote among all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, this 26th November 1949, do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this constitution. That was the preamble. While the constitution was originally adopted on 19th November 1949, enumerated justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity, it made no reference to the preamble in the preamble to India being a secular state. The word secular was added by the 42nd Amendment which came into operation on 1st September 1976. The statement of objects and reasons appended to the bill for the amendment contain, contains no explanation for the amendment of this uh, word, nor does it give anything to indicate the special significance of this word. Till the 42nd amendment became effective, the word secular occurred only once in the constitution, and that is in Article 25.2a, which empowers the state to make laws regulating or restricting any economic, financial, political, or other secular activity, which may be associated with religious practices. Surprisingly, the debates in the constitutional assembly, though very illuminating on several aspects of the drafting of the constitution, hardly contain any speeches on the aspect of secularism, even by respected leaders like Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Patel, and Maulana Azad, who were its staunch votaries. Dr. Ambedkar made a statement on the floor of the Constituent Assembly, though in a different context, which had some relevance. There was discussion in the <coughs> Constituent Assembly on Article 13 on the 2nd December 1948, when an attempt was being made to introduce a clause to save personal law. Dr. Ambedkar contended that Article 44 of the Directive Principles, which was under consideration, required that the state shall strive to bring about a uniform civil code. He opposed the saving clause, and which would disable the legislature in India from enacting any social measures whatsoever. He said, the religious conceptions in this country are so vast that they cover every aspect from birth to death. There is nothing which is not religious. And if personal law is to be saved, I am sure about it that in social matters, we shall continue to be a standstill. <coughs> there is nothing. <coughs> Please pardon me for these frequent interruptions. There is nothing extraordinary in saying that we might strive to hereafter 
to limit the definition of religion in such a manner that we shall not extend it beyond beliefs and such rituals as may be connected with ceremonies, ceremonials, which are essentially religious. It is not necessary that the sort of laws, for instance, laws relating to tenancy or laws relating to succession should be governed by religion. In Europe, there is Christianity, but Christianity does not mean that Christians all over the world or in any part of Europe where they live shall have the same uniform system of law of inheritance. No such thing exists. I do not see why religion should be given this vast, expansive jurisdiction as to cover the whole of life and prevent the legislature from encroaching upon that field. This was the powerful speech <coughs> of Dr. Ambedkar. The judgment of the Supreme Court in Dr. Ismail Farooqi versus Union of India others on the acquisition of certain area by Ayodhya Act 33 of 1993 discusses at great length the concept of secularism. And I quote, <clears throat> the, the Supreme Court says, notwithstanding the fact that the words socialist and secular were added in the preamble to the constitution in 1976 by the 42nd amendment, the concept of secularism was very much embedded in our constitutional philosophy. The term secular has advisedly not been defined presumably because it is a very elastic term, not capable of a precise definition and perhaps best left undefined. By this amendment, what was implicit was made explicit. If secularism was implicit in the Indian constitution, it becomes necessary to discover what were its contours, its roots, and why it became necessary to reintroduce the concept by an amendment brought about in the preamble in the year 1976. The Indian constitution evinces a complex awareness of these sometimes contradictory impulses that have figured <clears throat> so prominently in the Indian national experience. The common source of these impulses to uproot and to preserve is religion's thickness as a social phenomenon. The depth of its penetration into the fabric of society. The locus classicus on the constitutional content of secularism is the famous judgment of the Supreme Court in SR Bombay versus Union of India. In the long judgment, there is an intense analysis of several basic features of the constitution secularism being one of them. There are several judgments and I will not read all of them. Otherwise, the next two days, I'll be reading only the judgments. <clears throat> uh, for two reasons, time is not in that favor, and my throat is also not in favor. I just, G, Justice Ahmadi's judgment this is important. Justice Ahmadi said, notwithstanding the fact that the word socialist and secular were added in the preamble of the constitution in 1976, by the 42nd Amendment, the concept of socialism, secularism, was very much embedded in our constitutional philosophy. The term secular <coughs> has recently not been defined, presumably, because it is a very elastic term, not capable of precise definition, and perhaps has been left undefined. By this amendment, what was implicit was made explicit. The preamble itself spoke of liberty of thought, expression of belief, expression, belief, faith, and worship. While granting the liberty, the preamble promised equality of status and opportunity. It also spoke of promoting fraternity, thereby assuring dignity of the individual and the unity and strength of the nation. While granting to its citizens liberty of belief, faith, and worship, the constitution abhorred discrimination on grounds of religion, etc., <coughs> but permitted special treatment for scheduled castes and tribes. Vide articles 15 and 16, etc., to promote harmony and spirit of common brotherhood among the people of India, transcending religious, linguistic, and regional or sectional diversions, and to value and to preserve the rich heritage of our composite culture. These provisions, which I have called briefly 
clearly bring out the dual concept of secularism and democracy, the principles of accommodation and tolerance as advocated by Gandhiji and other national leaders. By the 42nd Amendment, what was implicit was made explicit. <coughs> the learned judge's thesis was <clears throat> reiterated by the decision of, by the judgment of Justices Salman and Kuldeep Singh JJ, and also who observed something very interesting and said the concept of a secular state is quite distinct from secularism of the kind who are <coughs> which we are advocated to as was found in Europe. As you all know, the word secular became popular in Europe because of the clash between the clergy and the kings. In order to distinguish the church and the <coughs> kings, they said king would be secular, church would be ecclesiastical. So this broad division was made, so which gave rise to the idea <coughs> that secular meant irreligious or non-religious. Now in the Indian context, the Supreme Court judgment clearly points out that we do not mean secularism in the sense in which Europe has adopted the world. We mean it in a different way. In what different way? Please note what they say. No doubt the two concepts are independent, interdependent <coughs> in the sense <coughs> that it is difficult to, con to conceive of a society or a group of individuals being induced to ad adopt a secular philosophy or secular attitude without the aid of a secular state. A secular state is not easy to define. According to the liberal democratic tradition of the West, the secular state is not hostile to religion, but holds itself neutral in matters of religion. Then I also say, the coming of the partition emphasized the grand, the great importance of secularism. Notwithstanding the partition, a large Muslim minority consisting of a tenth of the population continued to be citizens of, the Indi of independent India. There are other in important minority groups of citizens. In the circumstances, a secular constitution for independent India <coughs> under which all religions could enjoy equal freedom and all citizens equal right, and which could weld together into one nation, the different religious companies became inevitable. This is the reason given by the Lanet judge. Now skip all these judgments and go straight to what, the, <coughs> what was emphasized by the court in the Bombay's case. The court referred to conceptualization of secularism and refuted the argument that it was an empty concept by observing it. They quoted Professor Upendra Bakshi extensively in paragraph 306. Then they said, <coughs> secularism according to Upendra Bakshi in the Indian constitution connotes a, the state by itself shall not espouse or establish or practice any religion. <coughs> Friends, we have several countries I visited most of them. For example, in English, there is an established in England, there is an established church. Israel claims it to be a Jewish state. Pakistan is an Islamic state, and the Middle East, there are several Islamic states. Now, we are not espousing any religion, is the theme that reverberates in the constitution, <clears throat> the theme that has been exposed extolled and presented by the Supreme Court in Bombay judgment. Public revenues will not be used to promote any religion. The state shall have the power to regulate any economic, financial, or secular activity associated <coughs> with religious practice. The state shall have the power through law to provide for social welfare and reform or the throwing open of the Hindu religious institutions of a public character to all classes in sections of Hindus. The practice of unchurchability is abolished. Every individual person will have in that in order an equal right to freedom of conscience and religion. These rights are, however, subject to the power of state through law to impose restrictions on the ground of public order, 
morality and health. The, in short, all the affairs of the state in its widest connotation, <clears throat> in all the affairs of the state, religion is irrelevant. It is strictly a personal affair in this sense and in this behalf, our constitution is broadly in agreement with the US constitution. <coughs> the first amendment of it, the first amendment of it declares that Congress shall not make, shall not, shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free extensive exercise. Now, the term ameliorative secularism has been used to describe the essence of constitu our constitutional approach to religion in India. And simultaneously to distinguish that regime's distinct solution from alternative models present in other politics. The term is a conceptual projection of the multifaceted character and layered meanings of Indian nationalism, including both its commitment to social reform and its mooring in rival and contentious religious or cultural traditions. Thus, the constitution seeks an amelioration of the social, <coughs> social conditions of people long burdened by the inequalities of religiously based hierarchies, but it also embodies a vision of intergroup harmony whose fulfillment necessitates deliberateness in the pursuit of abstract justice. The constitutional challenge implicit in the agenda involves reconsidering two ways of life that are in fundamental tension with one another. The purpose of secularism could very well have been served if we had actually depended on the shortest article of the constitution, namely article 14. For it prohibits the state from denying to any person equality before the law or equal protection of the laws. What more could have been, um, what more would have been wanted for being secular? But instead, we added articles 25 to 30 about religious and cultural rights as fundamental rights. Why did we do that? Donald Smith, professor of political science, Pennsylvania University, provides an exegesis in his, he has written a nice book called India as a Secular State, in which he says and confirms that the widespread belief in Indian secularism became necessary. He dismissed the <coughs> on facile ground, the notion that the concept of secularism as involved in Europe is germane to the Indian context. He thinks that the Constitution of India establishes the concept in, in stipulating that there is no provision regarding an official state religion. There can be no religious instruction in the state schools, and there can be no taxes to support the particular religion. Besides, the proclamation in the present preamble guarantees the fundamental rights to that effect. In a secular state, <clears throat> Faith or any religious or spiritual pursuit is a matter of personal choice of the citizen. Let me tell you some personal experience of mine. <coughs> when I was asked to head that commission uh, into going into the Bombay riots incident, the Lord Chief Justice, I was about second or third from the bottom, uh, all my learned seniors declined and said, we don't want to get into this. <clears throat> so when it came to me, I said, I don't know anything. And like an ignoramus that I am, I'm willing to do anything that comes in my way. But I have one difficulty. This is a direct conflict between Muslims and Hindus. And I am a known practicing Hindu who sits in the court with a big tikka on his head. Now, tikas have become very popular today, but I've been used to tikas from the time I was a child. So I said, how can people have faith in me? The learned Chief Justice, great lady here, she is, asked me one simple question. She said, <clears throat> in the morning every day, when you don your robes and sit in the court, do you consider yourself a Hindu 
Muslim Christian Parsi what? I thought, no, I'm just a judge. I don't care about what I am at home, but here I'm only a judge. He said, that is precisely what is required for you to do as a commission of inquiry. And if you carry on with that, you will have no difficulty whatsoever. Ladies and gentlemen, believe me, that is one mantra I followed successfully. In a secular state, faith or any religious or spiritual pursuit is a matter of personal choice of the citizen. The state shall neither impose nor prohibit any such pursuit or consequent practices going with it. Difficulties and confusion arise when the law happens to be in direct confrontation with customary practices. The legally enforceable part of which is called personal law, its roots being the person's faith. What is the competency of the state to interfere in the personal practice or personal law of a citizen? Secularism <clears throat> is one facet of equality projected on the plane of religious belief. How are those core, core values of equality conceptualized and sought to be protected in Hindu culture? As we shall see, these values were at the zenith in Hindu culture, which set up a golden standard with this the state was enjoined to attain and maintain. Secularism, justice, Equality, fraternity, and liberty are undeniably the core constitutional values that can be subsumed under the overarching concept of human rights. They are intended to be protected so as to enable the citizens to reach their maximum potential of evolution socially and culturally. An examination of the status and protection of human rights in ancient Hindu culture and tradition would prove illuminative in this ground. Now we go to the Hindu traditional values. Values in Hindu culture and tradition. Indian values regarding human rights perhaps have the oldest pedigree. Rigveda, which is regarded as the oldest literature, declares Sangha Chadvam, Sangha Dadvam, Samvo Manam, Sijanatam, Samani Mantra Samitis, Samani, Samanam Manasaha, Jittam Esham. Samani va akuti, Saman akhdajani va, Saman habas to manojo, Yatana susahasati. Loosely translated, it means gather together, talk together, know each other's minds. May your consultations and assemblies be unified. May your minds and intellectuals be common. May your resolutions be united and your hearts beat in unison. May your minds unite to make you happy. This indeed is the assertion of equality and fraternity that was much later declared by the French at the end of the revolution and reiterated in the American constitution. That is the very basis of human rights jurisprudence. The Rigveda reaffirms that all are equal and there should be universal brotherhood for all round development of society. And it says, Ajayasthaso akanishthasa ete sambhrataro vavrutasso bhagaya Without distinction of superior and inferior, these are all brothers growing up together in prosperity. The Atharva Veda declares the concept of human equality by the words Samani Prapasaha Bonna Bhagaha Samane Yoktre Sahavo Yunajmi Arana Viniva Ritaha. You have equal rights in the articles of food and water. I bind you to the yoke to live together like the spokes of a wheel and be in the hub. The concept emphasized here is of mutual assistance and cooperation for all round development of by society. Indeed, if we look at the practices of all major ancient civilizations, we find that every one of them had a similar ideology and a similar system designed to protect the individual's safety and dignity, both in times of war and peace. A brilliant author, Paul Lawrence says, and I quote, despite their vast differences, complex contradictions, internal paradoxes, cultural diverse uh, variations, and susceptibility to conflicting interpretation and force argumentation, all of the great religions, religious traditions, 
share a universal interest in addressing the integrity, worth, and dignity of all persons, and consequently, the duty toward other people who suffer without distinction." Unquote. Expressing similar views about other traditions such as Judaism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Christianity, and Islam, Paul Lauren argues that together they make the significant contribution to the evolution of international human rights. Firstly, <coughs> they, they established values, normative standards, and ideals, ingredients essential for any and all international human rights. A concept of responsibility to common humanity. And finally, by developing concepts of duties, these religious traditions provided an inherent beginning for discussion of rights that proved to be enormously important source of inspiration and strength for those who campaigned for human rights later. He also says, by seeking to develop a moral imperative or universal sense of obligation toward humankind, these religious traditions help to establish and provide and uh, provide an inter, uh, inherent beginning for discussion about rights. <coughs> Indian society since the very inception was essentially a duty-based society. Please note, people ask me, you've asked me hundreds of times and I've answered this hundreds of times. Indian society has always been a duty-based society. Anybody who has read the Bhagavad Gita will immediately jump up and say, that's, that's correct. All aspects of human conduct, from cradle to the funeral fire, were governed by rules that compendiously were called dharma, another elastic word. The concept of dharma was that of a universal cosmic principle that holds all mankind together. <coughs> Dharana dharma ityahu dharma dharayate prajaha says the Smriti. <coughs> the duty of a king to protect his people, the duty of a son to take care of his mother and wife, the duty of a daughter to remain faithful to his husband, the creation of etc. etc. The creation of duty in one individual necessarily resulted in the creation of a right in the other individual and the consequent protection of that right. Therefore, instead of making right the function of social life and establishing a rights-based society, our ancient wise philosophers this, of this land preferred to establish a duty-based society where the, right, <coughs> where the right given to the individual is the right to perform his duty. The Vishnu Purana expatiates on this idea and goes on to say, Atra Bharatam Shrestham Jambu Dvipe Mahamune Yatohi Karma Bhumi Resha Tatonya Yoga Bhumiya. He says, In these circumstances, Bharata is regarded as great because this is the land of duty in contradiction to others, which are lands of enjoyment. Mahatma Gandhi, please go back to Mahatma Gandhi echoed this thought and said, I quote, <coughs> India is essentially karma bhumi, the land of duty, in contradiction to bodh bhumi or land of enjoyment. The immortal injunctive words of Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita of which everyone is aware, karma nyeva adhikaraste maafaleshu kadachana, <coughs> exultingly remind us that humans have only the right to do what their duty without seeking reward. Professor M.P. Singh, a good scholar, has an interesting explanation for this transformation from duty-based rights to rights-based society that we see today. In his book, he says, if a right so defined <coughs> always creates a corresponding duty, could it not be argued that existence of a duty in one person towards another is as good as the creation of a right in the other? The main objection to such an argument is that what happens if the person on whom the duty is imposed does not perform it? The answer is that in either case, there is a breach of law, which could be corrected by legal action. 
just as legal action could be instituted for the enjoyment of rights, it could also be instituted for the enforcement of duties. But because, of, because in the West, the concept of human rights developed against the state, perhaps theoretically and strategically, state could not be subjected to duties unless the existence of rights were recognized in the individual preceding the creation of the state. Therefore, rights in theory develop in the way it has been done today. <coughs> in pre-British pre -British India, people were deeply rooted in tradition and religion. Dharma was their watchword for all societal transactions. Kings and subjects were alike subjected to Dharma. Transgression from Dharma not only led to opprobrium, but even grave, gave the right to the subjects to depose the unjust ruler. Brihadharanika Upanishad tells us something very beautiful. The Brihadharanika Upanishad's description of Dharma as the protector of the weak and the instrument by which the weak can challenge the oppressor in the words, Tade tat kshatram, kshatrasya kshatram, ayad dharmaha, tasma dharma param naste. Yatho abali yan bali yam shamasham sate. This dharma is the king of kings. Kshatrasya kshatram. And there is nothing beyond it as it enables the weak to prevail over the mighty. Ladies and gentlemen, doesn't it remind you of Article 226? It is Article 226 in our constitution. But this is the concept in Duryadharanika. The coronation oath of the office of the king Vena. Uh, before, I must tell you something interesting. <clears throat> I was watching a television series called The Crown on Netflix. And I listened to the beautiful coronation oath given to King Queen Elizabeth at the time of her uh, ascension to, uh, as, as a queen. And I was reminded of what this is, exactly what it is. He says, with this holy oil, I anoint you so that you know that you are answerable to the subject. It is your duty to protect them. Exactly what this coronation in the Mahabharata, there was a king called Vena, and he was <coughs> crowned as a king. At the time of it, the guru gives him this oath of office. Now, we also take oath of office, but most of us have forgotten what it is. <clears throat> the oath of office is like this Pratignan Chathi Rohasa Manasa Karmana Gira Palaishyam Yaham Bhomam Brahmaiteva Chathakriti. Yes, Chatra Dharmo Nityoktaha Dandanita Vyapashriya. Take a note that by your mind, deeds, and words, you shall protect the world, considering it as equivalent to the Creator Himself. That you shall act in accordance with Dandaniti, that is the procedure code, I suppose, the, 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 the code of civil and criminal laws, and not according to your caprice. Hence, to say, that even in such a society, there was no recognition of human rights would be a travesty of truth and gross injustice to a highly civilized society. The Brihadarindika injection reminds one of the awesome power of red jurisdiction in our constitutional courts that hath no bounds but self-imposed ones. Brihadarindika Upanishad declares that the ruler too is obliged to follow dharma on pain of sanction for infraction. Dharma was an all-encompassing concept from natural justice to equality to considerate treatment of all mankind and exhortation to uh, co-determine for betterment of humankind. Betterment of each individual is the raison d'etre for later societies to identify and recognize human rights as basic, inherent, and hum inhumans. Well, Western society stressed the worldly progress and acquisition of material comforts, ancient Indian society emphasized both pravritti and nivritti. It is the urge to actively engage. It also uh, emphasized the three duels, pravritti nivritti, shreyas and prayas. Pravritti nivritti is, uh, pravritti is the urge to actively engage in material pursuits, while nivritti denotes the engagement in spiritual pursuits in pursuit of eternal happiness. Katopanishad teaches that prayas is the material happiness, while there is yet another spirituality, alter, spiritually alternative happiness of a permanent nature called Shreyas. It is hardly a wonder, therefore, that with this worldview, Indians emphasize Dharma as the instrument for achieving both. 
Indian thinking divided the objectives of the life called them by the name Purusharthas into four. The first is the primary compendious principle of dharma. The second represents material prosperity, artha. The third, worldly desires, karma. And fourth, permanent liberation from the strife and pains of life towards eternal bliss called moksha. The Indian thinkers believed that dharma was the root cause of the other three and emphasized its vigorous pursuit. Hence the lament of Vyasa Maharshi in Mahabharata. He says, dharma darthas chakamascha tasmat sakimarthan na sevyate. In fact, he says, Urdhvabahu, <coughs> towards the end of Mahavarta, he says, Urdhvabahu viramyesha nakaiyas chitshunoti me dharma darthas chakamascha tasmat sakin na sevyate. He says, I put up my hand in despair and I am shouting from rooftop. What? Dharma is the root cause of all other uh, arthas. Why don't people follow dharma? In fact, Manu unfortunately reviled so much. He goes around to say, Parityaje artha kamo yausyatam dharma varjito. He says, if artha and kama bereft of dharma should be forsaken. He thinks that pursuit of other purusharthas bereft of dharma was counterproductive to society. <laughs> dharma thus became the sheet anchors of society. <coughs> it, injected, <coughs> it injected humans towards compassion, kindness, service, consideration, and humane behavior towards all. Non-violence, truth, and myriad other ethical values on which human rights are based are all the fruits of dharma. These were the duties of all humans in society, and the trans transgression resulted in sanctions on individual constituents in society, which could be in the form of ostracization at the lowest and punishment at the hands of the state, represented by the king at the highest level. Even the king was subjected to dharma, <coughs> and transgression by him also could result in it being deposed by popular verdict or being defeated by popular uprising or by another king warring for upholding dharma. What is Mahabharata, Dharma Yuddha, the same story that you want to uphold Dharma? Uh, he said, um, Bhagavan says no Bhagavad Gita. Sukhinaha Kshatriya Partha Labhante Yuddhami Drisham. He says, Kshatriyas are really lucky people. Why? They get an opportunity to fight for Dharma and uphold Dharma. Hence the concept of Dharma Yuddhas and the exhortative injunction to Arjuna by Shri Krishna, Yudhyasyogatejwaraha, get rid of your delusive fever and fight. And Dharmyadhi Yuddha Chreyun Yat Kshatriya Syana Vidyate. There is nothing greater than Dharma Yuddha for Kshatriya. The first clear statement of rights is found in Kautilya's Arthashastra, where justice was assured as a fair trial and the right to produce witnesses. We are very familiar with that. Citizens has a right to trade and commerce, right to inheritance and to get standard wages, Article 19, Article 39. Women's right to Sridhana were recognized as the right to widow marriage, and in some cases, even the right to divorce the husband. People were guaranteed the right to protection by casting a corresponding duty on the ruler. They had to perform their duties in accordance with the tenets of what they called Rajadharma the equivalent of constitutional, we call it constitutional morality today, constitutional law in ancient India. <coughs> These principles apply to all rulers ruling any part of the country. In Kamandeki and Itisara, another beautiful treatise, an important authority and Rajadharma, following verse being the, the right that the citizens had and the corresponding duty of the king to, enu, to ensure this right to them. Every citizen has five difficulties, five types of fear, five types of dangers. What is this? All the officers who are applied, uh, appointed by state are themselves a source of fear for the human. 
the police is always a source of fear to the ordinary human being, law abiding citizen. Then, <clears throat> Chorebhya, with the police also you fear, the Chor also you fear. Parebhya, and enemies also you fear. The Hajavallava, people who are in power, people who are connected to people in power. Prithivi Patilovacha, and the avarice of the king or avarice of the rulers. People have, citizens have five types of fears. It is the duty of the king to ensure that these fears do not uh, exist. The best paradigm of enforcement of human rights is brought about in the Rajatarangini of Kalana, the Kashmiri poet of 12th century. He describes an incident of how King Chandra Pida, 680, 689, 690, AD, enforced the human rights of a poor and humble cobbler. The officers of the state, please note this is exactly what is a, a, a paradigm. The officers of the state wanted to construct a temple to the royal deity Tribhuvana Swami, but found the hut of a cobbler obstructing the construction site and the cobbler refused to move out. This, that's what we see normally in all the uh, acquisition proceedings. They decided to demolish that. The cobbler appealed to the king for justice and said and told him that his sat hut was as dear to him as the palace was to the king. In thundering words of rebuke to his officers, what does this, what does the king do? The king says, Niamyatam Yedva Anyatra Vidhiyatam, Parabhum Yapahare and Sukutam Yakankalankaye, Ye Drashtaraha, Sadatatam, Te Dharmalguna Kriyaha. It's a beautiful saying. I wish something like that would be inscribed in all public places where law and justice is supposed to be administered. <coughs> he says, stop the construction or move it elsewhere. Who wants to incur the blot of grabbing someone's land on one's own merits? If it was, if we, as the overseers of good and bad deeds, indulge in acts opposed to dharma, then who on earth will follow the path of justice? The sequel is interesting. The sequel was that the cobbler's hut was restored to its original position, which most of the municipalities we direct them to do if they had done something wrong. Unharmed to the cobbler, who gratefully acknowledged it, he comes back to the court's king's court and says this. Raja Dharma Anusare and a Paravata at the Vochitam, Sosti to Bim Paramdrea, Dharma Santa Badati, Darshayanti, Idrishasta, Sateya, the Machadinam. It was a very appropriate for you, King, to yield to another, that is myself, in accordance with Raja Dharma. May you prosper and live long, establishing the path of Dharma. Seeing such a faith in Dharma as you have, others will also call Dharma. Amelioration of misery of persons suffering poverty, disability, illness, and such other handicaps is enjoined as a dharma for every householder. This right is ensured by causing a duty on those that they are dependent on and also on the state. Mahabharata declares dharma includes the duty of an individual to maintain his dependence, saying, Akrodha, Satyavachanam, Sambibhaga, Kshamatatha, Prajanaha, Sveshudareshu, he says, for every varana person, for every varana, these nine duties are necessary. What is that? Being free from anger, truthfulness, <clears throat> sharing wealth with others, forgiveness, procreation of children from one's wife alone, purity, absence of enmity, straightforwardness, maintenance of persons dependent on oneself are the nine rules of dharma everyone has to follow. Significantly, the duties to share wealth and welfare of employees are equally included in the, uh, in the <clears throat> Hindu religion believed in religious Catholicity and jealously guarded the rights even of non-believers. This was also enjoined as a tenet of Raj Dharma. The Dharma, dharma Kosha proclaims Pashanda Naigama Shreni Puga Bratagana Dishu Samrakshet Samyam Raja Durge Janapade Tadha. 
the king should protect associations of non believers and believers in vedas or uh, traders uncultured people equally in the fort and in you know, outside in the villages the development and respect for human rights in ancient india is also seen in the directions given in the text for treatment of prisoners of war of or of vanquished kings kautilya sarthashastra prescribed fines for officers who obstructed or caused to obstruct prisoners in the daily routine of sleeping sitting eating etc the arthashastra also prescribed death sentence to anyone for the offense of rape committed against a woman arrested by an officer of the state this custodial rape is already thought of even during the time of kautilya hindu texts are fairly clear on the rules of warfare and these are codes that have been strictly adhered to since time immemorial we also had the vienna convention during the world war but neither party bothered to implement it in its true spirit these texts are elaborately <coughs> these texts elaborately prescribe the treatment of soldiers prisoners and vanquished kings manusmriti directs the king to place a relative of a vanquished king on the throne imposing necessary obligations after having ascertained the wishes of the conquered people it further directs the victorious king to declare lawful the customs of the inhabitants and to honor the newly appointed king and his personal attendants with precious gifts kautilya showing a deep understanding of the criminal justice system attaches great importance to human rights and on how the invaded ruler and his minister should be treated he recommends that they should be treated with humanity and justice and show mercy toward the people defeated in war he advocates that the defeated king should be made an ally and the key people advising the defeated king should also be eliminated by a silent war to be awarded to those who are and then uh, sorry uh, kautilya believed that law should be in the hands of the king and punishment need to be awarded to those who were guilty so that the king can protect himself from social unrest and unhappiness he believed that the punishments were a means to an end and that end was prevention of commission of crime he was essentially a reformist and he believed that punishments could reform a person and hence the society audi alterum partum is a latin maxim that we mouth every day it is one of the fundamental tenets of human rights no one shall be falsely accused or condemned on her is an integrated integral principle of human rights non arbitrariness Uh, by the ruler in dealing with subjects is highlighted in the ramayana rama is banished to the forest in the absence of bharata who was out of ayodhya when it happened when he returns bharata feels anguished and runs to rama and requests him to take back the, uh, the reins in his hand rama declines to return to ayodhya and take the reins again he gives excellent advice to bharata on admission Uh, an administration of the kingdom which is elaborated in a particular uh, chapter called kachit sarga in the ramayana rama's advice to bharata on not being arbitrary is in the following words he says yani vidya deshasthanam patanti asra ani bharata ani putra pashu unkhananti prityartha manusha sarga he says oh my dear <coughs> bharata the tears flowing from the face from the eyes of those falsely accused destroy the progeny and the cattle of the ruler who governs by caprice that means it is the most heinous things to do thus we see that human rights as we understand them today were equally a part of jurisprudence and governance in ancient india the difference however was that as the ruler was subservient to dharma which was the rule of law at that time there was neither occasion nor need to devise a machinery for enforcing them against the state it is because in the modern state the state has been found oppressing the subjects and frequently violating their human rights that an elaborate machinery had to be developed to protect them ancient indian jurisprudence was duty based and not rights based in comprehension of this vital difference is the basis for a misapprehension that there was absence of human rights in ancient india or that it was a gift of the western world to us the genius of indian thinking is that it was it has telescoped into what was predominantly a western religious concept i'm coming now to the modern india the genius of indian thinking is that 
it has telescoped into what was predominantly a Western religious concept of a religious concept of secularism. The ideas and ideals reflected in our scriptures and rooted in our cultural heritage, whether it be the homily of Sri Krishna to Arjuna, as narrated in the Bhagavad Gita. What did he tell him? Yo yo yam yam tanum bhaktaha sadhaya chitti tasya tasya chalam sadham tami eva vidadam yam. To whichever form of God a devotee wishes to pray, I grant him unflinching pray to do so. And or look at the advice of Bhishma in the Mahabharata. <clears throat> Bhishma telling to Yudhishthira during the last days of Bhishma, from the last hours of Bhishma. <clears throat> Sarvam Devan Namasyanti, Sarva Dharmascha Srinvate, Saddhadhana Dantascha. He says, those that pray to all gods and study all religions with belief overcome all travails. In the Mahabharata, our scriptures emphasize the basis of humanity is compassion, equality, respect for all religions and universal brotherhood. I repeat, in the Mahabharata, our scriptures emphasize that the basis of humanity is compassion, equality, respect for all religions, and universal brotherhood. Traditionally, each religion has been seen as a distinct system with its own focus. Thus, Christianity is seen as emanating the central doctrine of incarnation of Christ as revealed in the Gospels. Islam revolves around the Quran and the exemplary life of Muhammad the Prophet. The different varieties of Hinduism are united in devotion to one aspect of God. Seen with these lenses, the task of uniting the religions appears prima facie impossible because of the central or focal theme of each appears to be irreconcilable with each other. John Hick, one of the leading thinkers on the subject, <coughs> has proposed a Copernican revolution in the way we regard religions. Instead of seeing each religion as a separate belief system, he proposes that each should be seen as a response to a trans a transcendent reality. If you remember, before Copernicus, everybody thought each planet was separate. Copernicus is the one who said that the sun is the central planet and all planets are focused around it and revolve around it. So he's saying that, <clears throat> he proposes that each should be seen as a response to a transcendent reality. All people in all ages have had the experience of this transcendent, which terms it as real, but they have to be, had to interpret the experience according to the culture which they belong. If the function of religion is to give people a belief structure to help them understand this experience and to provide a framework within which they can respond to it. Experience of the transcendent is structured by the concept of the deity which presides over the theistic religions or by the absolute which presides over the non-theistic traditions. Each of these is schematized in actual human experience to produce the experience of divine personae, such as Jehovah, Heavenly Father, Allah, Vishnu, Shiva, Ganesha, whatever. And the metaphysical impersonates as Brahman, Tao, Dharmakaya, Shunyata, etc. To which human belongs orient themselves in worship or meditation. Seen thus, religion seems to be separate and rival systems and become diverse ways of responding to the same reality. Apparently, contradictory truth claims become different ways of interpreting and responding to the real one. In this sense, religions become united, all sharing the central focus. Hindu religion had long entered their thinking in the Upanishad, singing the glory of the Supreme Ones, Eko Deva Sarva Shabhute Shabhudaha. There is the same divinity is hidden within all of us. The Bhagavad Gita advocates a state of equanimity, saying, Atmanam Sarva Bhuteshu Sarva Bhutani Chappani Ikshade Yoga Yuktatma. <clears throat> he who sees himself as in all beings and all beings in himself is truly a seer and a true yogi. Shankaracharya's classic prescription for reading hatred and violence is Tvayimaya Sarvatraiko Vishnuhu Yartham Kupyasi Maya Sahishnuhu Sarvasminapi Pashyatmanam Sarvatrotruja Veda Jnanam. The same God resides in me and you. For no reason are you angry with me. See thyself in me, see thyself in everything and discard the differences that are apparent. 
the purpose of all religions is to unite and not to divide they should unite all humanity and also all humanity with the divinity into a finale of sammam bonam which mahanarayana upanishad describes as yatra vishumbhavati ekanilam the way the universe becomes one needs that is the point of convergence of all religions that is the point where all religion religious conflicts vanish that should be the true yoga of unison the truly indian idea of secularism was not merely an attempt to embrace the western concept of liberty equality fraternity and secularism with a new tint but a genuine attempt to adapt the well known concept to the ethos of the multi religious society it was an attempt to strike a just balance amidst competing and conflicting religious values to ensure that the spirit of democracy and liberalism is maintained it is a just reconciliation of guaranteed religious rights no religion has superior rights but all religious rights are equally guaranteed under the constitution indeed it is a marvelous feat of balancing faith in the public sphere now comes the interesting thing so where is the dichotomy friends now see the dichotomy if this was the ekre ekme ekme of the basic values of hindu culture and tradition and formed its bedrock why did it become necessary to reintroduce them as core values in the constitution and guarantee them as inviolable fundamental rights <coughs> was it merely a case of reinventing the wheel or was there much more to it hindu society traditionally was designed according to the tenets of the shruti and smriti smriti taught us dharma shastra which elucidated the concept and tenets of dharma and their application in daily life the bhagavad gita bhagavad gita in the verse of shri krishna said chatur varnam maya satyam guna karma vibhagasha he says i have created four varnas based on the qualities and work of persons that was a completely rational basis for classification of society based on one's merit and avocations this classification resulted in society being classified into the intellectuals whose task was to learn preserve and propagate knowledge the warriors whose task was to protect and preserve society from harm the traders whose job was to help the society by uh, trading in societal requisites and finally the least educated became menials who helped society to maintain itself by undertaking the menial odd jobs though initially the professions were not expected to de- to devolve by birth somewhere during the passage of time there was an assumption made a for sure right that uh, <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> a for sure right that by selective evolution the circumstantial ambiance in their tendencies attain accentuation in the linear this gave rise to the idea of jati or birth human greed and avarice coupled with the inherent exploitative tendencies added color and strength to this concept which became the alter standard on demarcation of society the original basis of classification of society which is perhaps equally true in the so called classless societies based on the marxist principles also gave rise to a feeling superior feeling of superior and inferior by birth and exploitation of the so called inferior class and by the superior by the so called superior class somewhere along the journey over the millennia society discovered a section that was bereft of its normative standards and could not fit into any of the four well defined classification and started treating that section as untenable and heaped on upon them odious demeaning task and the problem the members of that section became the victims of exploitation and atrocities by other classes that considered themselves as superior this was the status of <coughs> thus was the status of hindu culture and tradition on the eve of the advent of the british the british did not attempt to too many societal reforms in this regard and their prime interest was in only governance without upsetting the deep rooted cultural and traditional norms of hindu society which they feared might engender a revolt the changes came through silent affirmative steps taken by the saints from north and southern india 
during the bhakti movement of 14th to 16th century. The reformist saints, taking advantage of the highly respected status in society, attempted to spread in local languages the very concept of dharma taught in the scriptures. Total cure of a deep-rooted deep malaise needs strong remedial medicine administered over a long, administered over a long duration. That was perhaps the reason the constitution makers enshrined in the chapter of fundamental rights, the fasciculus of Article 14 to 30, which by their nature enable members of the depressed and uh, exploited classes recourse to legal remedies to reassert their equal status in society. These articles forbid discrimination on religious basis, inter alia among other grounds. Article 17 is specially trained at abolishing unchangeability. Then there is a discussion about Article 6, etc. Et then we go ahead. <clears throat> despite, you now we come to the interesting thing. Despite all these highfalutin statements, declarations, and jurisprudence evolved by the highest court in India, has the situation drastically changed at the ground level? That is a question hardest to answer. Positively. The media reports of heart-rending stories every day about atrocities heaped on certain citizens of this country who are supposedly the proud repositories of the fundamental rights enshrined in part three of the constitution. The rights granted under the Atrocities Act and Human Rights Act and a congeries of allied legislations aimed at amelioration of such injustice to society. It is unfortunate that our practice is not compatible with our precepts. Introspection and self-analysis is the need of the time to disagree, to diagnose the etiology and determine the prognosis of the deep-rooted malaise that is currently afflicting society so as to find a lasting cure. Comparison of the structural basis on which society was devised earlier and its basis now might present a possible answer. Human beings are always subject to their failings as mere mortals. Their beastly instincts that lurk within them at all times do not get assuaged or exhausted by pandering to them, but reining them in. As Mahabharata says again in the Adi Parva, Naja Tuka Maha Kama Namukha Bhogena Shamyati Habisha Krishna Vartleva Bhoyeva Vibhattate Desires do not die down by pandering to them, but become more intense by like fire when fed with ghee. The remedy is adoption of dharma as the rain for curbing the wild horse within. It is not only curbs, it not only curbs the unjust, immoral, and unethical, unethical instinctive tendencies, but also eventually eliminates them over a period of time. This is discerned in the paradigmatic lives of several great persona in this history down to the present times. We merely pay lip service to their teachings, observe their birth and death anniversaries, and ask for uh, courts to be shut down on those days and garland their statutes. We hardly study their teachings and literature to imbibe from their lives and teachings. Okay. It, they're from them. In the ultimate analysis, they are contemporary models of what dharma has taught for centuries. Dharma played a dual role of curbing human foibles like karma and krodha, karma and krodha which eventually gave rise to most evils in society, but also enabled cultivation of tendencies beneficial to society like love, brotherliness, compassion, kindness, equanimity, charity, and many more morally beneficial tendencies, which in the long run resulted in a well-structured society. I remember when I was very young and I was just entering the university, I remember having seen a plaque somewhere which said, <coughs> Sa vidya ya vimukta ye. Rough translation means that is education which leads to liberation. So I thought this is some mumbo jumbo that the Upanishad must have said. Now, sitting back at the age of 80 years, when I think of it, that is equally true on the sociological plane. It is education that reads us through liberation. Liberation from what? Violence, anger pettiness, jealousy, and a host of other evil tendencies with which we try to harm other human beings. It is education that leads us to this kind of liberation. 
Such a society which is liberated tends to be just and guarantees the supreme values recognized by Hindu culture and tradition and also recognized as the inalienable basic features of our constitutional values. Unless all of us wholeheartedly reorient our thinking, commit ourselves to tread the path of dharma to become better constituents of society, there is bound to be divergence between precept and practice. There is bound to be this dichotomy between our speech and work. Mere constitutional declarations, judgments by the Supreme Court expanding the constitutional declarations, evolution of jurisprudence by courts, and the utterances of leaders cannot hope to reduce the divergence. If we cannot practice in society what all good books of the world teach us, the common golden thread running through them, then ladies and gentlemen, all glorious sermons from the judicial, governmental and other pulpits would be read there, nothing but full of sound and jury, full of sound and fury signifying nothing as the Bard of Avon said. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't taken too much of time of yours. And these are the my thoughts about the, the real Indian values of our culture, cultural values and the constitutional values and an examination of is there a divergence or dichotomy at the principal level or is only at the level in which we practice the, the divergence between theory and practice. Thank you very much. May God bless all of you. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your thoughts. Now I request Honorable Mr. Justice Arvind Kumar, Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court, to share his views on today's topic. My Lord, Honorable Justice Sri Krishna, former Judge Supreme Court of India, former and sitting, sitting esteemed brother and sister judges, learned senior advocates, learned advocates, respected ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I thank the organizers for extending invitation to me for presiding the memorial lecture held on the occasion of centenary celebrations of Sri Nani Palkiwala, a great jurist and an eminent economist. <clears throat> to commemorate the birth centenary, the organizers have held this Palkiwala lecture and none other than Sri Justice B. N. Sri Krishna, a jurist and former judge of the Supreme Court of India has been invited. After hearing the erudite and scholarly speech delivered by his Lordship, not only I am spellbound, but also I am left speechless. Here I may add, I had the first sight of His Lordship Justice Sri Krishna about nearly about 22 years back at Shingeri. And on that day, after hearing his speech, I thought that he would be the best person to be followed. And till date, not only I am following his judgments, but also the path he is treading. The enormous thoughts shared by his lordship requires to be delved upon by all the concerned, as it would be not only relevant in the present day context, but also for the years to come. To speak about Nani as he was affectionately called by his friends requires several hours or days and hitherto several books have been written on Nani Palkiwala. He started his life as a middle class boy and goaded by his father to take to the legal profession. Though aspired to be an ICS officer, he chose the path shown by his father and entered the legal profession. Hence, I am of the considered view that his father, Ardeshir Palkiwala, also deserves to be remembered in this hour for advising his son to join the legal profession, which is a great boon to this nation. I have heard from learned senior members of the bar and learned former senior judges of Supreme Court expressing, I quote, such arguments will not be heard by this court for centuries to come. The value of this great nation, inherited and preserved from thousands of years, namely cultural values, were very dear to Nani Palkiwala. He was often quoting that these values being the foundation of Indian civilization and heritage are steadily slipping due to modern lifestyle and aping of Western culture. What he meant by cultural values, 
includes respect to elders, hospitality, honesty, integrity, politeness, good manners, and respect to others. India is a pluralistic and multicultural society. Many religious gurus, lawgivers, social reformers, statesmen have come to guide and influence the life and culture of Indians. The Mahabharata, the Ramayana, Bhagavad Gita, Guru Bani, and the like scriptures have molded the thinking pattern and consciousness of Indianness, of the Indians. The struggle for human rights essentially reflects the concerns and requirements of modern human being, whereas the cultural values operated in a traditional context where many of the agencies which at present account for the violation of the human rights norms were not known. Indian culture never saw the individual or society as a antagonistic to each other. The Hindu vision was that of an orderly society with each individual discharging his assigned job. The individual and society were viewed as complementary for well-being of all. Those acting as guardians of the society were not concerned about or even conscious of the concept of human rights. Much emphasis was placed on the understanding of society from a norm, moral perspective. At this juncture, I am reminded of the Bhagavad Gita, known what is known and is called as Nishkama Karma, which is deep rooted in the minds of the Indian society, namely Karmanye Vadikarasya Mapaleshu Kadachane, meaning thereby discharge your duties without expecting any result or rewards. In fact, we find today most of the Indian parents consoling their children by citing this principle in the event of the latter's failure in any endeavor, despite hard work and sincere efforts. Next comes Ahimsa, that is human rights. Ahimsa can be identified as another key Indian cultural value, which ensures rights by implication and interpretation. It gives every life a right to live, is a reflection of the belief in the sovereignty of the people. In a broader sense, Ahimsa means much more than non-violence. It means not hurting anyone or any life, both physically and psychologically. And this is what was meant by what was meant by Nandi Palkiwala. Basically, it is a negative concept form from which flows a positive value that is protection. Ahimsa aims at ensuring and providing protected existence to everyone from mental and physical violence. And it is here that base, basic postulation of Ahimsa coincides with the main concern of the present human rights movement worldwide. I may add at this juncture that India's cultural values is large and its heritage runs into several centuries. The relationship between the Indian cultural values and many of the articles contained in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights are complementary. Indian culture is a combination of several cultures and has been influenced by history that is several millennia old. Historians trace it to the Indus Valley civilization while the philosophers trace it to the Vedic period and much more. Indian culture is reflected in diverse scriptures, epics, festivals, cuisine, articulture, architecture, languages, philosophy, fine arts, attire, knowledge of science, medical science, mathematics, geography, civic society, religion, etc. However, the fact remains that we are united just by the thought of being Indian, that is Bharatiya. Unity in diversity is the unique feature of our culture. Dharma is the base of Indian culture. By Dharma, we do not mean mere religion, but in its true sense, it is righteousness way of life guided by Dharma, which has 10 features. Meaning Dhriti, that is patience. Shama, forgiveness. Dum, always engaged in righteous deeds with restraints. Ashteya, not stealing, not harming anyone, not causing any loss or injury. Shaucha, purity within and outside. Indriya Nigraha, 
senses to always engage in righteous conduct. Dihi, increasing intellect by good deeds. Vidya, taking true knowledge. Atma Jnana, Satyam, always practicing the truth. And Akroda, always re remain calm without anger. These 10 features of righteousness, way of life, which are reflected uh, in our constitutional values. The preamble of our constitution prescribes the core values of Indian constitution, and it contains all such values that are universal, human, and democratic of the modern era. Indian culture has many different parts, and each is closely related with the other and has intricately woven values. They are deliberately, they are, they are liberty, equality, fraternity, sovereignty, socialist, secular, and democratic. Indian culture strongly believes in freedom of individuals from any kind of unreasonable, unreasonable subjection, separation, exploitation, or slavery. In fact, the soul is always referred to as free spirit. Had it not been for this concept of liberty, there would not have been unity in diversity. Liberty of thought and action is a fundamental value embedded in our constitution and Indian culture. The level of tolerance India and Indian has towards other cultures shows that India has always welcomed and accepted other cultures, blending with its own as its own. It is this value of respecting the rights of others to liberty of thought and action makes India a country with unity in diversity. By prescribing reasonable restrictions under Article 19, Indian constitution ensures that this liberty of thought and action is not used to belittle or diminish the beliefs and status of others. Virtue of patience and tolerance towards other cultures is upheld by our constitution. The history of Indian culture shows the existence of Republic, Ganatantra or Ganarajya in the past. In the age of Mahabharata, there were Ganas or states having Republican form of government. Sometimes many Ganas combined to form a Samaga or Confederation. The Mahabharata provides valuable information regarding non monocrean states. Two chapters in Shanti Parva of Mahabharata have been devoted to the nature and problems of Republican polity. The Bhishma Parva mentions Republican states of Kuru, Panchala, Boja, etc. Whereas the Shant Sabha Parva refers to Republican states of Sibis, Dasranas, Trigartas, Abhiras, Malvas, Andhaka Vrishni. In fact, Andhaka Vrishni was a confederation, the constituents units of which were autonomous parts under their own leaders. It is said Lord Sri Krishna was the chief of this confederation. Concept of equality is a relative term, depending upon the place, person, perspective, time, and circumstances. One idea of equality may seem, in, seem unequal to the other. The classification founded on intelligible differentia is always justifiable. Indian culture never encourages inequality in any form. When we speak about equality, we find that our ancient Vedas spoke highly about the equality of brotherhood. As my Lord Honorable Justice Sri Krishna said, Vasudaiva Kutumbukam, these words have been emanated from chapter 6, verse 72 of Maha Upanishad in Samaveda. It reads, Ayam Bandurayam Niti Ganana Lagu Chetana Chetasam Udhara Charitana to Vasudaiva Kutugavakam, meaning this person is mine and this one is not, he is made only by the narrow minded. For those noble conduct who know the supreme truth, namely the whole world is one family, in fact, this also finds place in Hitopadesha. Ayam Nijap Paro Veti, Ganana, Lagu Chetasam, Udhara Charitana to Vasudaiva Kutumbakam meaning this is my own and others are strangers is the calculation of narrow-minded and for the magnanimous thought, the entire earth is one family. In Isha Bhasha Rigveda chapter 10, verse 191, the principle of Sangha Chaddham is propounded. I quote, 
ಸಮನೋ ಮಂತ್ರ ಸಮಿತಿ ಸಮಾನಿ ಸಮಾನ ಮನ ಸಹ ಚಿತ್ರ ದೋಷ ಸಮಾನ ಮಂತ್ರ ಮಂತ್ರೋ ಯೋ ವೇಹ ಸಮಾನೇನ ಮದೋಹ ವಿಷ ಜುಹೋಮಿ ನಮೋನಿ ಆಕೂತಿ ಸಮಾನ ಹೃದಯ ವಾಸಮಾನ ವಸ್ತು ಮಾಮನೋ ಯಥಾವ ಸುಹಾಸಹತಿ ಮೀನಿಂಗ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಅವರ್ ಸ್ಪೀಚ್ ಬಿ ಒನ್ ಯುನೈಟೆಡ್ ಬಿ ಅವರ್ ವಾಯ್ಸಸ್ ಯುನೈಟೆಡ್ ಬಿ ಅವರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಥಾಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಗುಡ್ ಟು ಶೇರ್ ಎ ಕಾಮನ್ ಪರ್ಪಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಏಮ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಒನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಿಂಗಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿ ಜಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಒನ್ ಯುನೈಟೆಡ್ ಬಿ ಅವರ್ ಥಾಟ್ಸ್ ಪೀಸ್ ಬಿ ವಿತ್ ಆಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮೇ ಬಿ ವಿ ಬಿ ಟುಗೆದರ್ ಇನ್ ಹಾರ್ಮೋನಿ ದಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವೇದಾಸ್ ಗೈಡೆಡ್ ಟುವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಪಾತ್ ಆಫ್ ಈಕ್ವಾಲಿಟಿ ಕಲ್ಚರ್ is more than 5000 years old and has survived till date it has responded differently to influences of different cultures especially those of invaders and it has preserved absorbed and assimilated the different elements and this is the secret of the success of indian culture and civilization it is the aforesaid values which was very dear to the heart of eminent jurist nani palki wala and these rich cultural values or not or slightly not dichotomous to the indian constitution has been explained by honorable justice shri krishna in his usual erudite manner which is the take away of this great lecture delivered by his lordship i may candidly confess that by attending this lecture series i am enriched by the light thrown on different facets by the honorable speaker i would also like to state that the organizers have chosen the right person to speak on the indian constitutional values and cultural values of india are they being dichotomous or not by inviting none other than justice bellur narayan swami shri krishna who is an eminent indian jurist and former judge of supreme court of india and who was incidentally born at the same place where i was born that is at bangalore who he is a connoisseur of art culture drama classical music and who also holds post graduate degree in sanskrit from the university of mysore and author he is the author of several books i respectfully offer my humble pranams to the great speaker who has thrown light on different facets of various cultures and visavis with reference to the indian constitution and had i missed this program it i would have lost something in the life which i could not have probably got it back once again i thank the organizers for extending me an opportunity to be part of this program i thank all the speakers all the participants who have joined this program and i thank once again honorable justice shri krishna for speaking with his erudite thoughts and throwing light on all the facets thank you one and all sabhabhya sabhapati bischavo namo namaha jai hind thank you sir for sharing your valuable inputs with us now i request major general nilendra kumar to propose vote of thanks before that can i add one thing we were talking of uh, mr palkiwala i am reminded of something very interesting so a great poet was asked to describe what how was the battle between rama and ravana so he said gaganam gaganakaram sagaram sagaropamam rama ravana yor yuddham rama ravana yor iva he says ananya alankara that's called ananya alankara he said there can't be a simile for that if you want to describe the sky the sky is sky there can't be another sky similarly the ocean the ocean is the ocean similarly he said there can't be a simile or a paradigm for the fight between rama and ravana i'll quote that and say there can be a paradigm for palkiwala palkiwala is palkiwala ananya alankara thank you sorry for interrupting you <clears throat> thank you sir i request major general nilendra kumar to propose vote of thanks oh he oh. i've seen him after a long time <laughs> honorable mr justice uh, arvind kumar chief justice gujarat high court honorable mr justice b n shri krishna former judge supreme court of india a uh, number of other 
serving and uh, former judges of the constitutional courts senior advocate suresh shelerji uh, senior advocate and former justice kamal mehta ji number of other senior advocates advocates eminent persons media persons ladies and gentlemen i am deeply obliged to justice b n shri krishna for having delivered the keynote address today uh, the way he started from the preamble of the constitution to 42nd amendment and then going back to mahabharat kautilya manu ramayana and present day to justice amadi professor upendra bakshi to touch upon the subject was really uh, most erudite i am also thankful to uh, chief justice honorable mr aravind kumar chief justice gujarat high court who also in his own manner talked about his association relevance of mr palki wala to the topic nishkam karma and touched upon shanti parv samved ahimsa heritage i must say that uh, two years back we had the birth centenary of uh, nani palki wala and for that a birth centenary celebration steering committee headed by former chief justice venkat chalaya as chief chairman and mr t n chaturvedi former governor as a working chairman with the members as a justice sujata manohar uh, mr soli sorab ji fali nariman mr murli bhandare ashok desai pravin parekh arvind atar later justice uh, deepak mishra former chief justice professor upendra bakshi uh, and director iipa in an ex officio position and i was the honorary secretary we had uh, a number of events that were organized at delhi and at other places and i must say that uh, today's event which was uh, organized at ahmedabad and where we got to hear justice b n shri krishna uh, are uh, a tribute to the erudite uh, elo uh, elocutions by mr nani parkhiwala who was uh, undoubtedly india's best jurist during the century a persuasive orator eminent writer public right activist corporate leader path breaking diplomat and a great philanthropist who had become a legend in his own life and who was widely respected for his courageous defense of the constitution demand for tax reforms and emphasis on good governance i must say that uh, today's event and uh, the exposition that we heard Uh, to indicate that there is no dichotomy in uh, the cultural values and the constitutional values is a befitting tribute to that great son of india i would uh, also like to thank uh, senior advocate suresh and shelad ji one of the senior and leading members of the bar and a former advocate general uh, who organized and uh, gave the welcome address uh, his contribution in uh, arranging pt the side memorial lectures and number of other lectures for over 15 years is uh, known to everybody i am also thankful to justice uh, kamal mehta former judge gujarat high court for transforming his uh, uh, into reality his long cherished dream for organizing this event as justice shri krishna Uh, indicated that this was to take place uh, two years back, and it has actually uh, the lecture was delivered today. And uh, despite the not being fully well, sore throat, and inconvenience, uh, Justice Sri Krishna uh, deserves all our respect and accolade for having given this lecture. I would like to thank also Mr. Amar Bhat uh, for. Uh, his inspiring rendition of prayers at the start of the function and my thanks also 
to all the distinguished members of the audience today who heard this lecture with keen interest and patience. Thank you all. Jai Hind. Thank you everyone for joining today's session. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon.